I, this time I made sure to write into my script fantasy so that um, I, I, I keep skipping these games and then having to go back and answering and uh, all of those sorts of things. So, uh, going to be running through every game on the NFL slate this upcoming week. Uh, and we begin very early over in England. It is the Jacksonville Jaguars taking on the Chicago Bears. The Bears are favored by a point with the total sitting at 44 and a half. And uh, one of those that, yes, Gino, we will be talking about the 3-2 and two Denver Broncos. I... I saw that this week doing my like uh, power rankings and could not believe it. Um, that that is an excellent statement on where the NFL is at this point right now. Um, gross. But anyway, um, the the Bears favored by a point in this game, and a lot of the talk coming in is, oh well, home basically home field advantage for Jacksonville, right? I know they're not the home team, but uh, the, the base, basically home field advantage. So uh, wh why would anyone pick Chicago? Jacksonville, I believe the stat is they're six and five in these London games. So, I mean, that's better than their home record was in Jacksonville a lot of times. But still, th this is not a dominant home field advantage, whatever, whatever, whatever. They do know a few things, right? Like, you, you, know, you know how to figure out the body clock, and you know how to adjust to all the times, and you know the places to go to eat, and you know the places to not go to eat, and all of those sorts of things. But when it comes down to the actual football, it hasn't really meant a whole lot. And so I do not want to put a whole lot of weight into that when analyzing this football game. I more so want to look at what I think would happen if these two teams were playing at McMahon Stadium in Calgary, not necessarily what whatever soccer stadium it's going to be at this time around. So I, I still think that this is advantage Jacksonville. I think that their defense is just so good that it is... It, it, I assume this defense gives everyone problems. And I think if you guys have been watching this enough, you know that for Jacksonville, I do not view their offense as one that is matchup proof. Uh, quite the obvious, actually, or quite the opposite, sorry, actually, actually. So I think that this is going to be a Chicago defense that gives Jacksonville a whole lot of issues. And then on the... Chicago side of things when they have the football, Jacksonville's defense right now is 32nd in defensive DVOA, which is a stat that measures efficiencies and and things like that. So I, well, I, I'm still hesitant to put all of my chips into the middle on a Chicago offense. I do think that this week you can trust them a little bit more because of like Joe Flacco, ripped him a new one last week. And so part of the, the, the stats are going to be skewed because of how that game went. But I do think that you see that there is quite a few areas on the Colts that you can exploit. And Caleb Williams is getting better and better and better each week and more and more comfortable each week. And so I, I think that you, you trust Chicago in this game. I'm going Bears minus one as a pick and I'm going with the under at 44 and a half. And again, uh, because there are certain rules on this platform about gambling and all of that stuff, these are just what I would do. I'm not telling you uh, to, to, to do that. But yes, th those are ones that I would pick. And uh, the, the, the whole purpose of this segment is a pick per game. I've kind of gotten away from calling it that um, gimmick wise because there are some Fridays that I just missed. But um, yes, we are going to, I, I do a pick per game and then we'll, we'll keep track of how everything goes. And I will let you know on all of that. Before we get to our next game, uh, Conrad in the chat, speaking of McMahon, have you heard if the new turf um, they're installing is FIFA approved? I have not heard that. I... <laughs> Anything with McMahon, I assume, is barely approved by any health standard or anything like that. So to, to think that it would be a, a FIFA-approved turf would be, I, I think, very optimistic. Um, I think it would be sweet if they could do something like that and, and start to build that. Because it, it's obvious, Conrad, you know, with the support around Cavalry FC, I think there is a significantly more of a footy following out here in Calgary than I think people would give this city credit for. And so I, I, I'm not saying like, oh yeah, no, just bring the national team here all the time. But I do think that there would be at least an appetite if you wanted to do something with them. Now, the problem is you have a stadium that holds twice as many people three hours from here. 
up in Edmonton. And so it would be, it, it's a tough argument to say, no, just do it here because anyone who would come here can just go there and the place holds more. And so you can make more money. So it, it would be a bit of a tricky thing, but I, I, I would, I would like for there to be a bit more of a focus on that sport here in Calgary, because it is something that is, uh, I think, growing in a, a very significant way. Back to the uh, other style of football. It is the Tampa Bay Buccaneers taking on the New Orleans Saints. Bucks favored by three and a half. The total in this game is at 41 and a half. And the entire analysis of this is I just cannot get behind trusting Spencer Rattler. Now, I will say New Orleans' success for a lot of parts this season I don't think has been because the quarterback is just awesome and dragging this team. You know, like the whole um, move the sticks analogy that I like to use with Daniel Jeremiah and Bucky Brooks. By the way, just speaking this into the universe, Daniel Jeremiah, dream guest of mine, whether it be on here or on, on Sportsnet 960, that, that is a dude that I would just love to talk team building with for hours and hours and hours on end. But one of the things that they talked about is, are you a truck or are you a trailer? And... De Derek Carr has spent about 5% of his career being a truck, and then he got injured and went into trailer status for forever. So there isn't, and I think that is showing up in this number, um, uh, there isn't, I think, a, a significant decrease if Derek Carr isn't the quarterback for the New Orleans Saints. Although I will say, if, if Carr was playing in this game, I do think that the Saints are probably favored. So maybe there is a bit more of a shift number-wise than you would think. But so I, I do think New Orleans can keep it close. And I do think that that defense is good enough that they are going to be able to keep it close. And Tampa Bay's defense, we've seen a little leaky. A little leaky at times, right? So there is, I, I think, a few ways you can talk yourself into a New Orleans number. But I just can't get behind going with a rookie quarterback in this particular game. We have seen how much it takes rookie quarterbacks to get going. And so to go with Spencer Rattler here with minimal reps and all of those things, I just can't get there. So we are going to go Tampa Bay minus three and a half, and we are going to go with the under at 41 and a half. And I am now realizing that I said I wrote fantasy in here so I wouldn't skip it, and then I skipped it on the very first one. So we will do the fantasy advice here for Tampa Bay, New Orleans, and then go back to Jacksonville, Chicago after. For this game, I think you have to trust your main starters for Tampa Bay. Evans is a start every week. Godwin has turned into a start every week. Rashad White, I would try to find a better option than him, but I would also understand if you can't. Uh, but th this is not one that I think you roll with Bucky Irving or anything like that. Also, there isn't going to be a whole lot of tight end analysis in this game or, or this week in fantasy in general, because that position is um, just weird magic that doesn't make any sense and is difficult to try to track and follow in any meaningful way. So it, it is tough to say, oh, well, no, it's this guy over this guy. You're trying to figure out which predominantly large white man is going to trip into the end zone with the football. That's basically what the tight end position has come down to in fantasy. So if you think it is one of the guys who you have, great. If you think it's a different person that is on the waiver wire, do that too. It's very difficult to find tight end analysis. If you have a specific tight end question or any questions at all, ask me in the chat. But uh, yeah, for now, I don't know, maybe is the answer on all of them. For Tampa Bay, it's a no on Rattler. Although if you wanted to, I didn't even look. If you wanted to put together a um, DraftKings lineup, let's just see real quick. What even is Spencer Rattler? Uh, price-wise. No, I don't agree to marketing, blah, 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 blahs. What even is this kid in uh, daily? Also, just for, for those who play DraftKings, let me know. I hate that the main option is just the, like, main, basically the, the, the red zone slate, right? The um, the, the, the 11 o'clock slot and the two o'clock slot for those of us here in mountain time, one and four for those who actually follow it that way. Um, I, I am always having to go to, okay, no, we're, we're doing the Monday nighter and the Sunday nighter in there as well. Cause those are actual football games too. So like, unless I have, if I go through it and it's like, oh, I actually don't have anyone in either of these games. Maybe I'll take a look at those, but I, I hate that the default option is to just exclude some of those games. I just, I have never understood it. Uh, Rattler right now is $4,000 as a quarterback, which is below everybody. Like Kenny Pickett is 4,700, and he is the backup quarterback for the Philadelphia Eagles. 
So that's that's where we're at in terms of uh, Spencer Rattler's price. So if you want a major discount at quarterback and think that he and Olave will team together for a, a great performance, then go for it. But I, I otherwise, I think it would be tough to trust Spencer Rattler this week. I do think that you have to kind of go with Olave and Kamara just because of how talented they are and just kind of hope for the best in that situation. Um, but the, the rest of them, like, this is not a week that I am trusting Shahid. The other one, I know I just said no tight end analysis, and now here we are. But maybe this is just a anecdotal. I, I don't really have the um, statistical evidence to back it up. But... I do feel like rookie quarterbacks trust their tight ends, and it seems like there's no Taysom Hill in this game. So Jawan Johnson is, I, I think, someone who I, I I do believe of that clumped together group of tight ends. He is one who, like in the whole, like um, it's like a cartoon where all the d different things are piled up and it's it's these circles and it's just limbs or whatever. Jawan Johnson's head kind of just sticks out over the crowd in that big muddled mess of a cartoon ball that is the tight end spot in fantasy right now. So I, I think of those awful ones, you can trust him maybe a little bit more. Um, going back to Jacksonville against Chicago for fantasy advice. I would try to avoid most Jags in this game. This is not a Trevor Lawrence game. I think this pass rush really disrupts things. So I, I would look for a different option other than Trevor Lawrence. Um, you probably have to start ETN. And I do think that he gets a little bit. But I, I don't even know if this is a Bigsby game necessarily. So I, I would maybe look to, to avoid that. Hey, Deeds, how's it going? Um, th thanks for popping in today. The the only Jag pass catching option I would consider would be uh, Brian Thomas Jr. As he has turned into that type of a play every week. Uh, for Chicago, I think you give a few guys a look. Uh, Caleb Williams, I'm still not all the way there in trusting him to the point of suggesting that he start in fantasy football yet. But... It's an option if you you have, I was going to say if you have Mahomes. If you have Mahomes, maybe you're looking for a different option. Anyway, um, Swift, I think you kind of trust and just kind of like ew, wince a little bit because it hasn't looked great this year for super deep leagues. And as we talked about last week, uh, that would be 14, 16 team leagues and anything beyond. Uh, we had some sickos in 18 team leagues. How dare you? But I, I think you can go with uh, Roshan Johnson, and again, just hope that he stumbles into the end zone. But I like the pass-catching options, and I like the town ends this week for uh, for Chicago. Moving on, at Lambeau Field, it is the Green Bay Packers taking on the Arizona Cardinals. Uh, the total is at 47.5, with the Packers favored by 5 points. I don't know if we will have a defensive stop in this game at all. I, I think that both teams' defenses have shown some weaknesses. The, the the good thing for Green Bay is McKinney keeps getting interceptions every week. Last week, they did limit the LA Rams' offense, but it still wasn't as dominant as you would like it to be with the Rams having one good player on the offensive side. So I, I think that you can... I, I think that you can still kind of take from that that Green Bay's defense has some work that needs to be done. And Arizona's defense... Had a couple of weeks where, oh, maybe there's something. Oh, no, no, it's not. No, 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 there's just, there's not. The one thing you're hoping for on the Green Bay side is that Jordan Love kind of gets it back together. Because again, this offense probably shouldn't have had as many issues as they did against the LA Rams. And so I am assuming that it's going to get back on track. But it is the one thing that is keeping me from absolutely clicking on the Green Bay pick, if you know what I mean. Uh, so we're going to avoid that one. I am also going to say... Um, over 47 and a half. And so for the purposes of tracking for the pick per game thing, I am going to say Green Bay minus five, but I am also going to put over at 47 and a half. From a fantasy standpoint, start them if you got them in this one. I don't think either defense is any good. I think you can roll with both quarterbacks. I think you can run with Connor and Jacobs in this game. Even for the 14 and 16 teamers, Emmanuel Wilson could be an option. And all the wide receivers. Marvin Harrison is a must. Jaden Reed has turned into a must. But I think you can go with the secondary options. I, I do, as we've talked about, Michael Wilson is someone who has turned into a viable threat for the Arizona Cardinals in fantasy football. And I do think that Romeo Dubs' is, uh, temper tantrum is going to help get him a little bit more. And I think you can trust the tight ends in this game. So yeah, smoke him if you got him in this Arizona Green Bay matchup. On the opposite end of that, we go to Tennessee, where the Titans are taking on the Indianapolis 
Colts. Uh, the Titans favored by two and a half points with a total at 42 and a half. My pick for this game is Tennessee minus two and a half because I... I think they have just a couple more good players than Indy. Neither of these teams is playing very well right now. We have question marks around the quarterbacks at both teams. Will Levis gets hurt a couple of weeks ago, uh, but they have the bye week. Um, a, a lot of presumptions is that he is ready to go. And now Anthony Richardson has been back at practice and doing the damn thing there, which I don't think that helps or hinders this offense in any way, shape, or form. So th these are two teams that I don't really have a great grasp on. I continue to think that Tennessee should be better than they are, and I kind of continue to think that Indy should be worse than they are, and so I am going to uh, make a prediction based off of that and go with Tennessee minus two and a half, but that this is the furthest thing from a game that I'm going to be clicking on. From a fantasy standpoint, I, I don't want any of the quarterbacks, even if Joe Flacco is in there, I don't really want it. Um, for running back on Tennessee... Pollard's a start. He's worked his way into that. And Ty J. Spears is getting a little bit more of the offense as the season goes along. So for the 14 and 16 deeper uh, teamers, you, you can go with that one as well. And honestly, because we have bye week situations and stuff like that, it might be a play you have to go with anyway. Calvin Ridley, again, is a flex consideration. I think you can trust him. Waiting for D-Hop to break out. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering when New Hopkins is going to have his moment here and start to get going with this offense because he is way too talented to be as quiet as he has been so far this year. On the Colts side, it sounds like Jonathan Taylor is not practicing still. Sermon didn't look great last week and uh, the Titans, I have a perception of them that their defense is pretty good. Let's just see here real quick. What has Tennessee done against fantasy running backs this year? This is always tricky to do the, the research for me because I'm in uh, I'm in seven leagues and a few of them have different scoring, but I know that I set up the vampire one to have just as vanilla or in this case mayo in your coffee um scoring as possible so uh what have the titans done against running backs this year it has been okay well they've given up the 20th most fantasy points to running backs this season so uh, sermon isn't necessarily one that i think you have to rush out and and start there are in most cases if you got them you kind of have to but I, I i wouldn't be rushing to it and i think there's a good comparison in this game uh deeds saying um Spears was a bye week grab for me. I I think I might trust Spears more than I trust Sermon in this game. That's kind of where I, I have those guys at. Uh, Michael Pittman is an IR player now, so I think that Downs has a real opportunity to step up and show what he can do. We saw Pierce be the deep ball guy last week. That is a, if you're projected to lose, let's take a home run swing with this kid and see what he's got. But I, I think there are a couple of passing options in Indy, but basically... Everyone in this game, with the exception of probably Pollard, is flex consideration at best. Philadelphia taking on the Cleveland Browns. The Eagles favored by 9.5 with a total at 42.5. This is such a difficult one to look at, but I think this is the most intriguing game of the week. Because the Cleveland Browns have obviously quit. Like, it's just, it's done. That They are... That they have packed it up and just enjoying the fire, the finer parts of being in Cleveland in autumn. Because they offensively, if they make a play, odds are it's coming back because of a penalty. Defensively, they have talented players, but they're out on the field a whole lot because the offense can't do shit. And so they get worn down. And I think just emotionally, this team is beat to hell. So I would have some concerns about everything on the Cleveland side. But for Philadelphia, it has not looked great this season. They have picked up wins, which have been nice, but it hasn't really looked as convincing as you would have hoped it would if you were, say, a podcast host who picked them to win the division and finish first in the conference. That has... That, that, that really hasn't played out in the strong, convincing way that I would hope. Right now, they are a game and a half back of the Commanders for first in this division, so not where we thought they would be. It looked really bad against Tampa Bay a couple of weeks ago. They did just enough to beat New Orleans, and it looked better than I think 15-12 would lead you to believe, but still not great. Um, it didn't look great against Atlanta, and it looked okay at times against Green Bay, but that was a weird one with the turf being what it was. This needs to be a convincing win for the Philadelphia Eagles, and it just hasn't at any point this year. And so that is where I, I have kind of the trepidation that, like, it just feels like 
it's one of the things we talked about, honestly. I know I've just bounced between three different thoughts. Um, hey, can you, <laughs> can you tell that I kind of upped the five ounce today? Um, but for the NFL this year, anytime we have said, you know what? This needs to be a statement game for this team. It hasn't been. And there's such a trend with teams who are underdogs by more than five and a half points just winning straight up that... While it's difficult to trust the Cleveland Browns, I think you can at least put a bit of a sprinkle of hope, if you know what I mean, on the Browns as a bit of an underdog play here, because I just can't trust that Philadelphia is going to get it worked out. And so, against all better judgment, I am going Cleveland to plus nine and a half. But again, the furthest thing that I would be looking at in terms of making any type of a financial investment in anything in this game. <laughs> Conrad going, die, Eagles, die. Conrad, I don't know if we've talked about, who is your football team? And I, you know what we probably have, and I forgot, and I'm really sorry about that. Um, I just kind of assumed because of uh, San Diego ties, we were Chargers people, but... I mean, because of San Diego ties, maybe we're not Chargers people. So, um, but we're obviously not. Okay, we are Chargers people. Okay. Um, that is very aggressive against the Eagles then. But uh, understanding, like it, it's been frustrating so far this year. Um, ah, that's it. We got there. See, when in doubt, just assume that. So that that, that checks out for sure. Uh, also, sorry, I forget that I put these up on social media, or not on social media, I put these up on YouTube and in podcast form after, and the chat doesn't pop up in there, so they don't have a clue what we're talking about. Uh, Conrad says, uh, die Eagles die in the chat. Uh, I say, are you, I thought you were a Chargers fan. He says, I am. And then, uh, fuck Dean Spanos. So that is the... The, the second part of the, the phone call that you guys couldn't listen to when I was just rambling on there. From a fantasy standpoint, I know I just said that I don't think the Eagles get it done, but I do think that you have to trust your Eagles in fantasy this week. Jalen Hurts probably, you know, even though it hasn't looked all that good. Where is Jalen Hurts? I don't know why I keep closing the fantasy thing on my... Um, I, I keep closing the fantasy thing on my, my laptop. Well, I know why. It's because I'm constantly worried that we're going to be having those delay issues again. And so having more than two windows open at one time just feels like it would completely overwhelm anything that I am doing, which is, again, a great fear to have as a uh, streamer. Uh, Pup Snap. Thanks, Juju. Man, Juju Smith-Schuster helping people out. That That is, that is for sure. Uh, what a performance last week. And again... Maybe go out and check and just see where, where's where's this guy sitting right now, waiver wire wise. Because I think that he's going to have a lot of options or a lot of games like that. Maybe not necessarily points wise, but targets wise and opportunity wise. And I think that because they're on a buy, maybe a whole lot of people aren't necessarily picking him up. Um, Jalen Hurts right now is well. I guess it's weird to, to take a look at where they're ranking because we're into bye weeks and stuff like that. So he did miss a week, but uh, right now he is very low on the quarterback list. I do think you have to kind of trust him this week. As Conrad says in the chat, the Browns are the, uh, the, the Browns are the Browns. Um, oh, I think that was directed to the, the, the Browns are the Browns comment. That's fair. Um, but still, gave me a chance to throw some Juju Smith-Schuster analysis in there, which we always like to take it. But for the, uh, for, for fantasy for this game, I do think that you kind of have to roll with Hertz and see, but because he has Brown and Smith back, we are assuming, I think that this offense does get back to what we think it is going to be. Saquon Barkley's always amazing, so you have to go with him, and from the tight end position, again, Dallas Goddard is better than most, so roll with it. For the Browns, I'm not sure who you're trusting in this matchup, to be perfectly honest with you. Jerome Ford, I'm still waiting for him to break out. I still think there's a talented running back in there. I, I just think the situation's really bad. Also, I don't know if I'm trusting the offensive line there a whole lot, but Ford is probably a flex option. But even like Amari Cooper at this point, there are probably some rosters that have Amari Cooper on there that have three better options than Amari Cooper because of how bad this offense is. Cooper is so good that if you want to throw him in there and hope that you take advantage against the Philadelphia secondary that has been taken advantage of, I, I have no problem with it, but I, I'm the furthest thing from suggesting that he is a must start this week. On to Houston against the New England Patriots. Um, Texans favored by six and a half. The total is at 37 and a half. I... Again, everything in me is saying, hey, do not trust going with Drake May 
in this spot because as we have talked about here, Drake May is obviously the better quarterback than Jacoby Brissett is. But this team is not set up to help a rookie quarterback thrive in the National Football League. And so for him to be getting his first real game snaps behind an offensive line that is leaky against a Houston pass rush that, well, Houston's defense maybe has taken the slightest step back, the pass rush hasn't. And so I have real concerns about the safety of Drake May in this game. I, I think that they are going to be relentless in getting after him and really putting some pressure on, on Drake May. So I... I do feel like this is a tough spot that New England is putting this kid in. Um, I do think that there is a concern, though, in Houston. The offense still hasn't really put it all together. They looked dominant against Buffalo. Like, they, they, they look like a team that scored more than 23 points when you just look at the game and, and how it was played. But... It still hasn't really clicked. And the one thing New England can do, it's defend on not Thursday night games. And now no Nico Collins in the lineup for the Houston Texans. And a New England uh, defense that does a pretty good job of taking away the number one options on those teams. I do think that they are going to be a team that tries to take Stephon Diggs away. And if you can connect on with Take Dell deep over the top, by all means, go for it. But he is... We're not going to let Stephon Diggs beat us. If you're going to hit a couple of big shots, go for it, but that's going to have to be the way that you win this game. So I actually think, like, the, the under is the play in this one, and honestly, I don't know why I didn't highlight this uh, for myself before, but we are absolutely going to highlight that one there. Um, under 37 and a half, but I'm also going to say New England plus six and a half. I think the Texans win, but I do think that it is close. From a fantasy standpoint, as talked about, CJ Stroud, he's the 10th ranked quarterback in fantasy right now. I would still see if I could have other options out there. Um, for example, in the Vampire League, my wife, um, who is in second place right now, is a team that has C.J. Stroud, but also has Jared Goff. Rolling with Jared Goff this week in this matchup. So I think there are some quarterbacks out there that you can trust over a C.J. Stroud. Uh, Deeds, excellently put in the chat. Yes, um, optical blinking. Uh, thank you for the chat, but uh, we, we are all famous in here. Um, the, 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 we are a incredibly... Um, influential group in this chat, but uh, thank you for that. Anyway, um, at the running back spot, if Joe Mixon is playing, I think you kind of have to play him just because of how good he was in week one, but if it is Pierce or Akers or anyone like that, absolutely not. As I just discussed, I think New England is going to do a good job of limiting both wide receivers that you really focus on in Houston, so I, I, I don't know if I'm trusting anyone in this game on either side, really. I would do my best to not put Diggs out there, and Dell would be a if-you-are-desperate sort of a play. On the New England side, it's the same as always. You are trusting no one, with the exception of Ramondre Stevenson, and even then you're hoping he doesn't fumble. Washington taking on Baltimore. The Ravens favored by seven points with a total at 51 and a half. I think this game is going to be insanity. I think this game is going to be so much fun, and... This is the game where I am going to take Washington seriously. I know we had the chat earlier in the week about, uh, oh, well, who has Washington beat? And I countered with, who has anyone beat? Because no one's anyone in the NFL right now. The best team in the league, no one's taking seriously. And so if you're not doing that, who, who can we take seriously, really, in this league? And so I think that this Washington team is legit. I do have worries about their defense, still, for sure, but I do think that this is going to be a team that is going to be able to put points up. And they're facing a Baltimore secondary that has been very vulnerable to passing attacks this season. And so I think this game turns into the shootout that everyone thinks it is going to be. I the, Over 51.5 is pretty high given how the NFL has been going. But I think Washington is able to keep up with, with Baltimore. The one way that I think the Ravens win, and it's the thing that is keeping me from going the over on this game, I wonder if Baltimore tries to, uh, to, to steal a basketball term, dribble the air out of the ball. I think they try to just kind of run some clock, run this game down, and try to slow it down and play it at a pace that Washington, I don't, 
I don't want to say they're not comfortable at. We just haven't seen them play at it, and we certainly haven't seen them thrive in it. So I think that this is going to be... That, that would be the game plan if it were me, if it's Baltimore. Although you can certainly understand if they want to take some shots against a defense that is lacking in the talent department, although they have been coached very, very well by Dan Quinn so far this year. But I think that the holes in the Baltimore secondary do leave them vulnerable. I'm taking a shot in this one. I'm going Washington money line. Uh, I'm going Washington to win this straight up. I'm not even suggesting. Uh, uh, they're giving me seven points. I'm not going to take the points. I'm just going to go right at it. We're getting Washington to win this one. And from a fantasy standpoint, this one's easy. You're starting everybody. If they have BAL or WSH beside their name, Throw him on in there. I'm trusting Hill. I'm trusting Isaiah Likely. Sure. Uh, Ertz on Washington. Get him on in there. Robinson. Yes. Eckler. Totally. D all of them. Throw it on in there. And let's give this one a whirl. Because I think this game is going to be insane. Again, on the opposite end of that. Chargers taking on the Denver Broncos. Uh, the total in this game is 35 and a half. With the Chargers favored by three points in this game. Um, oh, Conrad, another uh, 0 5. That that's tough. I am I am 0 5 in in one of my leagues as well, and it's a keeper league, so we've we have started the teardown. But yes, this is the Conrad v Gino Bowl in this chat right now, with the Chargers favored by three against the Broncos. Denver, I will say, I am not one who is really in a spot where I give credit to Denver a whole lot, based off of you know fandom. I would like to say that I'm not biased on the show, but I mean, come on, come on. Uh, but as a Raider fan, yeah, I'm not, I'm not really one who throws out a lot of confidence against Denver, but they've looked better. They've looked better. I, and better than I expected, quite frankly, uh, I believe, love the, the, the shout out there, Gino, a uh, little bit of Bo Dallas in there, howdy, if you will. But I do think that Bo Nix is looking a little bit better and a little bit more comfortable in this offense already. And that is gives you some pretty big optimism for Denver and makes me, as someone who was very much a Bo Nix disbeliever, gives me a little bit of a, ooh, ooh. It's, it's starting to look like what it would look like if I was going to be wrong on that particular call. And since a, a bit of a scare early on, Javante Williams has also looked pretty good. But this defense continues to stand very strong. Now, as Conrad mentioned, they are a defense that is without their number one tackler now in Alex Singleton, who played a full game on... Uh, one ACL, which uh, bravo to him. And, but also that, that is why the ACL is already a, oh, well, he's walking off the field. Maybe it's not as bad. Uh, you can do that on an ACL uh, for a bit. And then eventually, you know, kind of just fall apart, but you, you can do that for a bit, but still no, nonetheless, very impressive. The one thing I will caution against like, oh man, watch out for Denver. Here they come is that they have looked good against the Raiders who everyone looks good against. The I was going to say they look good against the Jets. They didn't. They were just able to limit a very limited Jets team. And then they looked legitimately good against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, a defense that has proven to be a little bit leaky. And so I do think that maybe some of the reins need to be pulled in on these Broncos a little bit. And I think the Chargers are going to be the ones to do that. Conrad mentions in the chat, the quarterback has one ankle. And that is definitely a concern. Uh, you can go on one ACL, but one ankle, it's tough. Um... It is concerning that every game he looks hobbled, and every game, it th there's going to be a moment where it's, okay, well, he's going off to the sideline, and that blue tent is getting propped up here again. But I just think that the Chargers have the edge still in this game. You obviously like the quarterback significantly better. I would still take a one-legged Justin Herbert over a Bo Nix almost any day of the week. And from a, a running back perspective, I do think that there is... Like J.K. Dobbins and Gus Edwards, while I do like Javante, I think that group has really been going. Pass catchers, it's it, it's a watch, but I, I think the Chargers are just a bit of a better version than what uh, of the Denver Broncos right now. And so I am going to go Chargers minus three in this game. I do think the Chargers go out and and get the job done. Also, I just like the Chargers coach a little bit better. But again, credit to Denver for being better than I thought you were going to be at the start of this season. Um, from a fantasy perspective, my first note was, do you even own anyone in this game? We are looking at the running backs here. Dobbins and Javante Williams are the only ones I would look at. The, the other pass catching options, 
fine on the bench this week, even as we are into bye weeks. Uh, all right, we're going to have to pick up the pace on this a little bit. Pittsburgh against the Raiders. It's a good one to pick up the pace on. Pittsburgh, minus three. Total, 36 and a half. I'm going Steelers minus three. I don't think you need to analyze a whole lot of this game. The Raiders spent the better part of this week doing a quarterback competition, which by design, means that they were splitting reps in practice as they get ready for one of the best defenses in the NFL, which is utterly insane to me. The Raiders cannot run the ball. Their best wide receiving option doesn't want to be there and thus isn't right now. And defensively, they just gave up 38 points or whatever it was to the Denver Broncos, who, as we discussed, improved but not that improved. They also had Andy Dalton look very good against them. And we saw last week what good defenses do to Andy Dalton. Christian Wilkins is now on the IR. They have like two good players defensively and about the same amount on offense. I do not see a world where the Raiders do anything in this game. Now, I have said that about the Raiders before, and then they somehow, some way, come up with a victory. I just don't think this is one of those games. I think Mike Tomlin is the type of coach that Antonio Pierce aspires to be, and I think Tomlin coaches circles around Pierce in this game. I think the Steelers win this one in a rout. Uh, Pittsburgh minus three is the play. From a fantasy standpoint, I think you can trust Justin Fields, the aforementioned Bo Nix having a good game, and Andy Dalton having a good game. I think you can roll... I think you can roll with Fields right now. Um, with no Wilkins, you're trusting Najee Harris. And seeing what secondary back Pittsburgh throws out there, Jalen Warren limited in practice, and I think Cordero Patterson had an injury as well. But if either of those guys can go, I think you maybe take a look at it as well. And then Pickens in the um, at, at wide receiver, I think you can go with. The Raiders traditionally have been very bad against tight ends, but have actually been okay against them this year. So I, I Friar Muth is, is maybe an option for you, but um, I'm sure you can find some other ones as well. On the Raiders side, the only players you even consider every week are Jacoby Myers and Brock Bowers. Atlanta taking on Carolina. The Falcons favored by six. The total is at 47 and a half. Under is, I think, a bit in play here because I just don't think Carolina is going to hold up their end of the bargain on this. I think that we saw last week that while Carolina's offense got better with Andy Dalton, it's, I think, maybe a little bit more that they played the Bengals and the Raiders than it was that Andy Dalton was this great defense, which then led us down the conspiracy theory of, oh, they didn't want Bryce Young to look good against two lesser defenses, so they just stuck him out there against two good defenses, and, oh, well, it's obviously not going to work. Let's go to Andy Dalton now. Um, a little bit of throwing him to the Wolves in that. But, like, this is, there isn't a whole lot of analysis in this game. Atlanta is getting better. Carolina is still bad. The Falcons are significantly better. We're going Falcons minus six. From a fantasy standpoint, you're starting your Falcons. I, like Mooney, uh, London, Pitts, Robinson, probably even Algier. I'm, I'm rolling with all of those guys. And on the Carolina side, I think you have better options than Andy Dalton at quarterback. I would hope you would. And you, you do go with Chuba. Chuba Hubbard has been on fire, fantasy-wise. And Deontay Johnson has looked better with Andy Dalton in this offense. So I think those are two guys you can trust. But that's basically it. Uh, the game that everyone's excited about this Sunday is the Detroit Lions taking on the Dallas Cowboys. Detroit favored by three. The total is at 52 and a half. Boy, it's nice to have a couple of games in the 50s this week. I know we have a couple in the 30s, which like three years ago, you would have never thought possible, but uh, here we are. But this one, I think, does have shootout written all over it. The uh, We kind of mentioned last week that we were worried about Dallas and their banged-up defense, and then they were able to somewhat limit the Pittsburgh Steelers in a 20-17 to win on Sunday Night Football. I do think that Detroit is a little bit better to exploit that. And we saw them get back on track this week against Seattle on Monday night. I think they continue that momentum here. And while Detroit's defense is still one I have some concerns with, I think they're able to just outscore any of their problems against the Cowboys. So give me the Lions, minus three, in this spot. Um, as again, I think they're just kind of a better version of what the Cowboys are putting out there right now. From fantasy, you're starting your Lions. Goff is a play this week. Jamison Williams, Amon Ross, St. Brown, yes. Both running backs, of course. Sam Laporta, uh-huh. All of them. You're going with it. For Dallas, I think you can trust Dak this week. Detroit gives up some points through the air. Rico Dowdle is the running back you want in Dallas. And we saw last week, Kenneth Walker had a real big game against Detroit. So there could be something there for Rico Dowdle. CeeDee Lamb is in every week. And I do think that Jalen Tolbert, getting all those targets last week, that continues this week. And I think he is a play as well. We'll be waiting all day for Sunday night. And this is... 
this is what I call a brownie points Sunday nighter. Um, and it's a little, I don't want to say frustrating for me, but we are in our household, it's Canadian Thanksgiving. Uh, we are doing Thanksgiving dinner on Sunday. Um, but, uh, who we are doing with, they still have to work on Monday and quite early, uh, because they're both shift workers. And so we, we have said, we got to be done by seven so they can go to bed. So the only football I will be able to watch on Sunday is this fucking thing between the Bengals and the Giants. But if you have a significant other in your life who is not necessarily in the, uh, football watching mode, this is a big one where, you know what? I get like, We've been watching football all day and Sunday night football, it is like they, they have set it up. It's prime time. It's when the best matchups go, but you know what? Tonight's about us. Let's just, let's, you want to watch a movie? You want to go for a walk? You want to go out and here in Southern Alberta, inexplicably see the Northern lights everywhere. Uh, you, you want to, you want to just go do that? We don't need to watch this one tonight. This is, I've watched too much football lately. It's time for me and you time. This is, this is that game. This is the Brownie Points game. Because it's the Bengals and the goddamn Giants on Sunday Night Football for no good reason. Bengals are favored by four. The total is at 47 and a half. Um, the Bengals defense has given me major, major, major worries. And I, th this line feels like a trap. Because there is no way the Giants have played well enough to be within four points of Cincinnati. And I guess they looked good last week against Seattle. So maybe that is kind of dragging this line a little bit closer than it should be. But you look at both rosters and there's just, that there, there, there's no way that I am trusting the Giants in this spot. And so when you see it's only minus four, it's like, oh, oh, they're telling me I'm missing something. What am I missing? Because you look at like Cincinnati, they're going to want to attack through the air against the New York Giants. I mean, against everyone, right? And I think the, the, the Giants are not really equipped to handle a Chase, a Higgins, and all of those guys. So I think they're going to be able to have success. Now, the one thing on the Giants side is I think Brian Dayball scheming against this defense that doesn't look like it can stop anything is actually, you know, quite the sign and quite the thing to look at. But the Giants have Malik Neighbors on the IR right, or not on the IR, sorry, but he's not practicing. And so I have major concerns about what this offense is going to look like. And so the, the Giants, yes, they look good against the, the, the Seahawks, but they needed a blocked field goal at the end to seal that game away. If the Seahawks hit that and then go win in overtime, this line is probably like Bengals minus six, Bengals minus seven. So I think we're getting a value here. I am going to go Cincinnati minus four, but it's not one I'm clicking on because I am worried about day ball against this defense. From a fantasy standpoint, you're starting your Bengals. Um, I, I think you can even trust in the run game, Moss and probably Chase Brown as well. For the Giants, with neighbors still not practicing, I do think you can go with Wandale Robinson. And honestly, Daniel Jones is a boy, if you're desperate, you can roll with this one and and just go with it. Because I think that there will be some points to be had against this defense. But in terms of the rest for fantasy, it's tough because it's Sunday night. Singletary is limited. So I think in deeper leagues, you can still give it a shot with Tyrone Tracy in like 14, 16 team leagues. But you may want to avoid that one, maybe a little bit more. Um, and, and try to find someone else. And then we go to Monday night. It's Buffalo taking on the Jets. The Bills are favored by two and a half. The total is at 40 and a half. I know that the new coach bump has been a thing in the NFL lately in that first game, but a lot of times that is when you are going from a coach that people don't like to a coach that people don't do like. You know, like the, the Raiders got a bump going from Josh McDaniels to Antonio Pierce. I felt happier when that move happened. And he wasn't even my coach. Uh, he was coaching my team, but still like that, that, that was much more vibes based. This one, it feels like the vibes are off. Like it, it feels like, oh, well, Aaron Rodgers definitely had a say in it. Aaron Rodgers is like, no, I was as blindsided as everybody else. This is a coach that a lot of people liked and a coach on the side of the football that was actually playing well. Now there's talk about, okay, well, this guy's going to be in charge of play calling and all, all of these sorts of things. And so, yes, maybe you feel a little bit better that, well, the play calling is going to be better if it's not Nathaniel Hackett running it, but we still have, that they made these changes like Tuesday and Wednesday. I get you have an extra day because it's Monday night football, but still, that is a quick turnaround to implement a whole lot of changes. Doing it against Buffalo does make you feel a little bit better because this defense isn't good, but it just feels so tire fiery out in New York right now that I have to go with the Bills in this game. I think Josh Allen gets right. I think that... 
James Cook is going to be able to run on this Jets team, similar to the way that Minnesota was able to run before Aaron Jones got hurt in that game out in England. So I think James Cook, that, that we're going to go old school with this Buffalo offense, and Sean McDermott is going to love it because they're going to run the ball like 50 times in this game. But I think James Cook is definitely a guy that you can look at. Shakir's not practicing, so I don't love any of the pass-catching options from a fantasy standpoint for uh, f for Buffalo. Um, you have to... You have to start Allen every week. He's your quarterback, right? I do think that Aaron Rodgers is an okay option fantasy-wise this week, given the Buffalo secondary thing, but we just talked about why I'm maybe a little hesitant on that one. Um, and I think you have to trust Brees Hall and Garrett Wilson. Wilson does finally show up. You're hoping that Brees can as well in a matchup that maybe feels like a bit of a plus one for them. So those are my picks and my predictions for every game in the NFL this week.